Getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 191, Lenin's Cruelty, Stalin's Ambition. Last time, revolutionary Russia was suffering. The land under Lenin's control was shrinking, and those still under him were on the verge of starvation. The latter was directly due to the former. The Germans held the Ukraine, the Czechoslovaks, Western Siberia, the Cossacks, the Don, the Kuban, to the northeast of the Black Sea, the center of Russia. The last two had been breakaway groups, taking advantage of the Bolsheviks' very real military weakness. What Lenin's party still controlled had eaten through its stores of food, and the harvest was still months away. Food was needed now for Petrograd and Moscow. If nothing changed, Lenin might end up losing these two cities, and his rule would have certainly come to an end. But the last aspect of this very large problem was for Stalin to handle. Stalin landed in Tsaritsyn, modern-day Volgograd, on June 6, 1918, and it had to be held, or else when the harvest did come, there would be no avenue to get it further north. Of course, Stalin, who didn't think much of his fellow Russians, was about to come into contact with many non-Russian nationalities. But if he could put aside his even greater cynicism of them, any progress here would raise him in Lenin's eyes. Back in Petrograd, the German ambassador Count Wilhelm Mirbach, who had been working on a prisoner exchange, the Germans needed as many of their men as they could get to finish off the West, treated the Bolsheviks and rode home as if they were already out of power. After all, German forces were still advancing east, while separatist factions, as we have seen, had already taken Russian territory, with no reprisal. In early May, the Germans had reached or taken Sevastopol and Rostov in the Don River Basin. By now, they had acquired 17 former Tsarist provinces and Poland. Some of the Bolshevik Central Committee wanted to renew Russia's treaty with Britain and France as the enemy was only some 100 miles or 160 kilometers from Petrograd and 300 miles or 482 kilometers from Moscow. But then the Germans just stopped. Why? For several reasons. One, Lenin was in constant communication with Berlin through the German ambassador Mirbach, and his message altered. One day it would be, we have signed Brest-Liptovsk, and honor it. You are the one breaking it. I have to work strenuously to keep the peasants from rising up against German forces. Then his message would be, if you continue to take our land, we will destroy everything, which means you will be controlling nothing. Well, nothing of value. And this may sound strange, but that was Lenin's carrot. The stick was far worse. Back in Berlin, Lenin's man, Adolf Joff, who was the son of a rich merchant, used his own resources to supply the German Social Democrats, who wanted to openly overthrow the government. Joff also handed out weapons, sending a shiver down the Kaiser's spine. The last part of Germany not finishing off the Bolsheviks by taking the last two large Russian cities was that, for many in Berlin, Now that Russia had been subdued, the next target had to be Paris. Anything else was a waste of time and resources, and that only prolonged this miserable war. Back to the East, as this was Bolshevik Russia, it was time for another Congress. 
Zverdlov was able to postpone the Congress because he needed to fill it with more Bolshevik delegates. Never mind that they weren't formally elected from wherever they represented. By the time the Congress got underway, on July 4, 1918, at Moscow's Bolshoi Theater, there were 678 communists, 269 left SRs, and 88 other unaffiliated delegates. Still, right away, many started shouting, Down with Mirbach! Down with Brest! The Bolshevik peace treaty with Germany. But Trotsky fired back, trying to change the argument, all agents of foreign imperialism who wanted to renew the war should be shot on the spot. Then, it was the turn of the left SR's most prominent delegate, Maria Spiridonova, to speak. The left SR had helped the Bolsheviks gather and hold power, as they had joined Lenin's coalition. But after Stalin had sent armed men into some of the SR's villages to requisition grain, more on that later, it was time for the smaller but nonetheless vital party to break away. Lenin, after hearing Spiridonova speak, said, If these people prefer walking out of the Congress, good riddance. Of course, this was a tried-and-true method for Lenin. If he could get them to walk out, he could get on with voting on the issues. And it's not like he was ever going to give up power. Those days were over. But the SRs outfoxed the older Bolshevik. Knowing that their proposal to break the treaty with the Germans would fail, Spiridonova had ordered a young man, 20-year-old Yakov Blumkin, to kill the German ambassador. On July 4th, on the day the 5th Congress of Soviets had started, and there would be other terrorist acts against the Germans, the left SR goal being to work the Russian peasants up into a lather, who would then attack the advancing enemy forces. Blumkin met with the ambassador's first secretary on July 5th. He also brought along a photographer who held a case for his equipment. But there was no camera inside. The conversation seemed to be going well, and Mirbach, apprised of this, came downstairs to join in. This is when Blumkin calmly reached down and took out a Browning pistol. He began shooting right away. His first couple of shots missed, which allowed Mirbach to make a break for it. But the younger man then steadied his hand and began shooting again. The ambassador was hit in the back of the head and would later die that afternoon. The two assassins jumped out of a nearby window to a getaway car that was waiting for them. The Congress was to start up again just 45 minutes after Mirbach died. But before that, the remaining German embassy sent word. They wanted Lenin sent to them. Not having much of a choice, Lenin went, but took the capable Zverdlov with him. Lenin listened as the Germans raged, but they alone did not have the authority to say the war was back on. A request of orders would have to be sent to Berlin. Lenin was able to walk away, not that his day got any better. A few answered questions later told him that the very body that was to protect the Bolshevik Revolution, the Cheka, had ordered the assassination. Lenin sent the director of the Cheka, Zerzinski, who was not in on the murder and still loyal to him, to find out what was going on. Yet when he arrived at Cheka headquarters, the leadership there arrested him, the director. When Lenin heard of this, he put another in charge of the rebellious group. Not that it would do any good. The leadership wanted war with Germany. Still, it needed to seem that Lenin was still in control. As July 5th ended, it seemed as if there might be a race of who could kill Lenin first, the Germans or the formerly loyal Cheka. Lenin and Zverdlov seriously considered leaving Moscow that night, but that would have been the end of the Bolshevik Revolution. No, either way, they were going to win or die in the attempt. There was no going back. The now-confused Congress started up again the next day, 
July 6th, at 8 p.m. The SRs, still dominated by Spiri Danova, who now carried her own Browning pistol, told the delegates that Mirbach had been removed. Only then did the 400 delegates of the left SR leave to gather upstairs, obviously to plan their next move, which had to be the removal of Lenin. In reaction, the Bolsheviks also left, but really just to gather and to wait to be arrested. But no one came. Turns out the SRs had sent their armed men into the streets of Moscow to gather more Bolshevik members, but did not bother with Lenin. A bad move. Lenin focused himself and decided on his own course of action. While he was waiting, he sent a telegram to Stalin in Tsaritsyn. Around 3 p.m., a left SR killed Mirbach with a bomb. The left SRs arrested Zierzynski and started an insurrection against us. We are about to liquidate them tonight and shall tell the people the whole truth. We are a hair's breadth from war with Germany. Stalin wrote back, encouraging his leader, and that he did not think much of the left SRs. Hysterics was how he ended his response. Yet, there was one small problem with Lenin's plan. Actually, two. The Red Units, who still sided with Lenin, had been sent east to deal with the Czechoslovak rebellion. This left him with the Latvian riflemen. But when Lenin ordered the assault, it was to take place in the early morning of July 7th, which happened to be St. John the Baptist's Day a Latvian national holiday. So the Latvians ignored the order and left Moscow to celebrate. They promised to come back soon. The left SRs had about 700 men, stationed in Moscow's inner-walled Kyatgorod. Coming at them would be, fighting for Lenin, Yakums Vasitius of the Red Latvian Rifle Division. The Latvians had kept their word to return. The SRs had better equipment, in terms of guns, including four armored cars. But as they were in a defensive position, and mentality, their firepower would not manifest itself. Facitas decided not to charge, thus giving the defenders a chance to use their superior firepower, and instead brought up a 152mm howitzer. It was fired the moment it was in position though no one can really claim to know how long the bombardment went on, the SRs soon started fleeing the structure. Zerzinski was rescued, and Spira Danova, she decided to stay and fight, along with hundreds of the other SR and Cheka personnel, were arrested. Later that afternoon, the Council of People's Commissars confidently pronounced, the uprising has been liquidated. Those still with the Cheka saw the writing on the wall, and thus switched back their loyalty to the Bolsheviks, who then helped Lenin reduce the left SRs further. Many who were captured were soon shot. Those of the SR who were not captured joined Lenin's party. The Bolsheviks now had power to themselves. Lenin resumed the Congress of Soviets on July 9th and pushed through his proposals. The major one was a constitution declaring that all central and local power belongs to the Soviets and calling for the abolition of all exploitation of man by man, the complete elimination of the division of society into classes, the ruthless suppression of the exploiters, the establishment of a socialist organization of society, and the victory of socialism in all countries. So Lenin and his Bolsheviks had dodged another series of bullets, but the Germans weren't gone yet. Also, if anyone was looking for a rallying point in order to pull Lenin down, the royal family was still around. Having been moved several times, when Nicholas and his family were on a train and passing through Yetkarinburg, they were abducted by Ural's Bolsheviks. Lenin was already gathering information to place the royals on trial. 
Either way, this was going to be messy, and Lenin didn't have the time for another problem. But in July of 1918, the rebellious Czech Legion was coming ever closer to yet Kadinburg. So the leading Bolshevik there rushed off to Moscow to consult with Lenin. Apparently, a decision of some kind was made. On July 2nd, the Council of People's Commissars created a commission to draft a decree which nationalized all Romanov family property. Soon after, the Yetkadinburg Cheka, newly created, took over control of the prisoners. On the night of July 16th, a verdict of death was handed down. There had been no trial. The family would be put before a firing squad. Without going into the gruesome details, and they are very gruesome, Nicholas, his wife Alexandra, and their son Alexei, of 13 years, and his four sisters, aged 17 to 22, along with the family doctor and three servants, were taken down to the basement of the mansion they were held in. The order was given, multiple shots rang out. Not all died right away and required a second shot at point-blank range. The Bolshevik government never took credit for the deed, but on the other hand, the Moscovites did not seem to be upset by the news. Yet Lenin did not seem content, or rather safe, with his latest string of bringing his enemies low. So there was another attempt to raise a Bolshevik army. But that failed miserably, as those who presented themselves soon left off and became highwaymen. Berlin did not seriously consider setting up a pro-German government in Moscow, as Lenin had stayed loyal to their desires. Besides which, the East was no longer the most pressing problem. As the Great War was winding down, though not through one side conquering more land, but from sheer national exhaustion, the British, who had no love or trust of communism, sent an expeditionary force to Archangel up north. The idea was to renew the threat to Germany from the east, but also to push Lenin out of power. Lenin reacted by sending a representative to Berlin to ask for German troops to come to Petrograd to protect it from the Allies. A treaty supplementary to Brest-Liptovsk was signed on August 27, 1918. But Germany was in such a state, the agreement was practically meaningless. Most, if not all, assumed the Bolsheviks were on their way out. It was a good time for Stalin to be out of the area. With so many smelling blood on the water, Bolsheviks of all stripes were attacked, assassinated, or simply disappeared. On August 30th, Lenin arrived hours late to give a speech to an anxious crowd. They had questions, but he had no answers. Still, he spoke for an hour and ended with victory or death. And as he was about to enter his waiting car, he received the crowd's decision. Shots rang out. One bullet hit Lenin in the chest, another into his left arm. Lenin would survive, but as his fate was uncertain at the moment, Trotsky stepped up and proclaimed their leader as the greatest human being of our revolutionary epoch. The Bolsheviks were supposed to be about classes, not individuals, but most knew that if Lenin died, the revolution was over. Chaos would reign. Again, Lenin did survive, but the chaos came anyway. The former allies supported those Russians opposed to the Bolsheviks, though most of them did not want a return of the Tsar. This threat, along with the Czech soldiers already in Russia, led to a civil war that started in November. In reaction to this outbreak of hostilities, where the entire country was up for grabs, Lenin imposed war communism. Basically, it was his idea to instill any measure that would guarantee victory. If peasants refused to hand over their harvests, they simply disappeared. 
If they refused to plant new crops at the beginning of the season, they disappeared. If anyone tried to organize a strike, they disappeared. The resulting famine would cause the deaths of some seven and a half million Russians. But Lenin was only focused on victory. Luckily for him, he had Trotsky. Though not trained in warfare, the younger man's passion made him a natural leader. If someone showed aptitude, he promoted them. If they failed, he had them shot. Such measures allow the smaller Red Army, in time, to defeat the Whites, as they were called. The Red Terror that came with the outbreak of the Civil War alone caused the deaths of tens of thousands of Russians. As we have seen, Stalin was sent to Tsaritsyn in June of 1918, and the Volga Valley, with its massive industrial center and ability to raise crops, would make it vital to the war effort. Stalin arrived with 460 armed men, and his task was simple. Take as much food from the southern area and send it north to feed the populace of Moscow and Petrograd, thus keeping the people there content. Stalin's title was Dictator for Food Affairs in South Russia, but it would be the armed men with him that he would use primarily to succeed. But when Stalin was sent south, at first he was not supposed to be Lenin's main representative. That position was to be held by another. But as the situation in Moscow worsened, that man stayed behind. Stalin was sent on alone. But even upon his arrival, he found himself outranked by someone Lenin had sent earlier. Red Tsaritsyn's supreme military commander, Andrei Snesarev. Snesarev had been a Tsarist staff officer who was taken up by the provisional government due to his experience. But once it folded, Snesarev gave himself to the Reds. Lenin happily took him on and sent him south in late May with a mandate signed by himself, making him the new military commissariat of the North Caucasus. Snesarev got to work building a new army from the local partisans. When Stalin arrived, he wore a collarless tunic, a quasi-military style, and had a local cobbler make him a pair of high black boots. His wife Nadia was with him, and she wore a military tunic, acting as his secretary. Now that they looked the part, Stalin wrote to Lenin that soon he would be shipping vast amounts of grain to Moscow, and promised his leader that he would not be lax in his duty. But in that same message, Stalin did not hesitate to launch into his own civil war against Snezarev. He complained that the rail line had been cut, but that he would repair it. Working for Lenin and the betterment of socialist Russia was one thing, but if he did not benefit from it, what was the point? Stalin had learned from past experiences that enemies were everywhere. Soon after, the first shipment of 9,000 tons of grain was on its way. Of course, how much of that reached Moscow was beyond Stalin's ability to control. Yet after that first shipment, Stalin seemed to focus more on his self-imposed battle with other Red authorities by writing constantly to Lenin. And added to this mix of survival of the fittest was a recently self-formed Tsaritsyn, Cheka. These men were cruel from the outset and used the Cheka's wider reputation for harshness to benefit themselves. Anyone who complained against them was tortured and killed. But before too long, they were being led by Stalin. The how of this is not known. The combined strength of Stalin's men and the local Cheka could not subdue Snezarev's local Red Army of some 20,000. As that was the case, Stalin sought to cut off the army's head, instead of engaging the more numerous soldiers. Stalin constantly wrote to Lenin and Trotsky that even more grain could be sent north, perhaps this is why he did not send much after the initial shipment, 
but that Snezarev was not using the Red Army properly. Stalin then took his private war to the next level with a letter that read, There is plenty of grain in the South, but in order to get it, we need a functioning apparatus that does not meet obstacles on the part of the military echelons, commanders, and such. Therefore, for the good of the cause, I need military powers. I have already written about this, but have received no reply. Very well. In that case, I shall myself, without formalities, dismiss any army commanders or commissars damaging the cause. The absence of paper from Trotsky will not stop me. Amazingly, Trotsky had no problem with this. Of course, he may have been distracted by the events in Moscow. He replied, If you consider it undesirable to retain Snesnerev as military commissar, inform me, and I will remove him. Your Trotsky. Stalin quickly replied in the affirmative. Now that Snesnerev was removed, the military commissariat of the North Caucasus by a local revolutionary military council would be run by three men. Stalin the top Tsaritsyn Bolshevik Sergei Minin, and a local official. Sisnarev was still in charge of his forces, but answerable to the three-man committee. As such, the first thing Stalin had him do was to put all available forces under Klim Voroshilov. Stalin had met Voroshilov in 1906, and though he was no military man, he had a connection with the men who appreciated his sincerity. Yet Voroshilov was Stalin's man from the first. But the notion that Sisnarev still had many men under his direct control did not sit well with Stalin. So in early August, Stalin had Sisnarev and the entire local artillery directorate arrested and placed on a barge moored in front of Cheka headquarters. Trotsky found out about this. Obviously, he had his own spies there and sent a man to rescue Sesnerev. He was saved, but everyone else on the barge would die of starvation or be shot later that summer. They were all Tsarist-era military men, and Stalin did not trust them. Trotsky would send other letters south ordering that his men be allowed to get on with their duty. But as the letter made its way to Stalin first, he wrote on it, Take no account, and only then passed it on. Another Bolshevik, Marovsky, of the Supreme Council of the Economy, who had his own letter signed by Lenin, had been given the task of sending fuel back north. Yet he had been given 10 million rubles to acquire the resource. Marovsky arrived in late July but was told by Stalin that he could travel no further south, as bandits had taken control of the rail line there. Marovsky, not making the best decision, left the money and his wife in Tsaritsyn, and went back to Moscow to report the situation. He returned on August 13th, but was then arrested with his wife, and the 10 million was taken by the Cheka on Stalin's authority. Yet Stalin wisely stayed away from Cheka headquarters during Marovsky's interrogation. When the prisoners told their interrogators that they were working for Lenin, the local Cheka replied, In Moscow, they do things their way, and here we do it all afresh, in our own fashion. The center cannot dictate anything to us. We dictate our will to the center, for we are the power in the localities. Of course, word of this got back to Moscow, so the local Soviet started an investigation. They also looked into the numerous summary executions by the Tsaritsyn and Cheka. The Cheka informed the Soviet that they were taking orders from Moscow, which confused the investigation. But really, they were being led and advised by Stalin. Eventually, Morovsky would be freed, but the money and his equipment stayed with Stalin. Soon after, Stalin and the Cheka proclaimed that millions of rubles had been discovered 
and what's more, were being used to conduct acts of counter-revolution. Stalin used this excuse and his authority to execute 23 leaders of the supposed white guard plot of right SR officers. Stalin then used his experience with the press to justify what the Cheka had done, but also stressed that political reliability was more important than military ability. The necessity of the military arts is fine, but if the most talented commander in the world lacked political conscious soldiers properly prepared by agitation, then, believe me, he would not be able to do anything against revolutionaries who were small in number, but highly motivated. Yet it seemed that Stalin had finally gone too far. When word of this reached General Peter Krasnov, the elected leader of the Don Cossacks, he had his army surround Tsaritsyn. The locals, rightly so, were terrified of the idea of being raided by Cossacks. But even then, Stalin was trying to harness their fear by never letting up on the ideas that spies were everywhere that the threat of counter-revolution was still very real and the greater danger. Prisoners were marched out to dig defensive trenches. Many would die from exhaustion and a lack of food. Yet Stalin never gave up on his propaganda, that political loyalty was more important than any or all skills. He even had several technical specialists shot when he needed them the most, to control the rail lines. But as they had a specialized skill, they were the enemy. It would seem that Trotsky would have to send some of his forces south to save Tsaritsyn, which angered Stalin greatly, but one enemy at a time. day in nature. Boy, do I feel capital A alive! Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Multivitamin Gummies. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. Nature's Way.